Well, hey, welcome everybody. My name's Rich and I lead the Central Gathering. It's so good to be speaking to you today, whether you're watching this in venue or you're watching this as part of our Church at Home live calls. It's great to be speaking to you. Uh, we are continuing in our series on prayer. Dan kicked us off last week uh, and our great hope, he said this, I'm going to say it again, is that we grow in our prayer lives through this series. Not that just that we hear different people talk about prayer, but it actually gets us praying more. However, I'm not a mind reader, you'd be glad to know, but I can almost bet as soon as I mention praying more for a large portion of the room, there was maybe a bit of an internal, maybe external sigh. Why? Because maybe you've tried this before. Maybe you've had many moments of committing yourself afresh to pray and nothing's really changed. You haven't prayed more. Maybe you haven't found new depths of intimacy that you hear other people talk about. So be honest in this moment, right? Hands up if you can sometimes find prayer hard. My hands up. Hands up if you sometimes lack some motivation to pray. Hands up if your mind wanders sometimes. You find yourself thinking, ah, I wonder what I'm going to have for lunch later. Or you look in the distance as you're trying to pray and you see that broken shelf that you said you'd six, fix six months ago and you're like, still haven't done that. Or maybe you get just getting into it and you suddenly remember, ah, oh, I've dropped the kids off at school and they don't have their lunch. I can see their lunch on the kitchen table. Like, And maybe you think to yourself, how is it? How is it that my mind so easily fills with such mundane things when I'm talking to the creator of the universe? Put your hand up again if you're willing to admit that you've ever been bored praying. Maybe keep your hand up if you ever think, well, if I'm bored, I wonder if God's bored. It's crazy, isn't it? Like we can be talking to the most important person in the world about the things that are most important to us and we can be bored. As a result, I think that lots of us can think that maybe we're the problem. The problem must be on our end. You know, it's not on God's. You know, he's perfect. We know that. And maybe you've thought, well, if I can get bored doing something as important as praying, then maybe, does that make me a second-rate Christian? Maybe it even leads you to harder questions. Questions about, man, do I really love God if I can get bored spending time with him? Do I really care about the things I'm praying about? On top of that, what does any negative experience do? Well, it doesn't exactly leave you wanting more, does it? So gradually what happens? Maybe you pray less and the cycle continues. What's going on here? I want to contend to you that the problem isn't actually us, that you're not a second-rate Christian. And also the problem's not prayer. I think the problem can be our method. Let me illustrate with this. Suppose you won a contest and the grand prize of this contest was to spend an hour in conversation with anyone you like. For a full hour, you can ask any question. You can talk with this person about whatever you want, whoever you want in the whole world, right? Who would you choose? World leader, maybe? Sports personality? An actor? A musician? An artist? An influential Christian? A best-selling author? Me? I'm free. That was a joke. Let your mind run wild for a second. And then imagine I said to you that this conversation has been scheduled for tomorrow morning. I bet you couldn't sleep. I bet the anticipation would be building. And now imagine you have the conversation and it is everything that you hoped it would be. You know, sometimes we can be let down, can't we, when we meet people. But this time you, you weren't let down when you met this person. It was all that you hoped it would be. Afterwards, I said, you know what, great news. Tomorrow, you've got another hour-long conversation with the same person. But, but the only caveat is you must say exactly the same things you said today. Hmm. Maybe you think, okay, I might pick up you know, a couple of new things that I missed the first time around. But then what if I told you that you had to have the same conversation every day for the rest of your life? It probably wouldn't be long before you would rather die than endure the same conversation. And I think the sad truth is that for many of us, it can feel the same way when we talk to God. That it's not because you don't love God. It's not because you don't love the things that you're praying about. 
but that often we can end up just saying the same things about the same old things. And if and when we do that, prayer becomes monotonous. It can feel like empty phrases maybe. We get bored and when you get when, and when praying becomes what boring and you don't really feel like praying, and when you don't feel like praying, what happens? Prayer becomes hard work. You have to compel yourself to pray. And our prayers can become joyless. Our minds wander. And all of a sudden, a really short time feels like a really long time. We get apathetic. Maybe we give up. Maybe we get disillusioned. So now I've painted such a bleak picture. Let me give you some good news. You'll be glad to know there's some coming. It doesn't have to be this way. One of the answers, not the only answer, but I think one of the answers to our lacklustre mundane prayer life is to pray the scriptures. It's to pray through the verses of the Bible. Now, I should say that at this moment, that for many of you, this might be a well-worn path. You know, maybe you've had this one in your locker for a long time. I'm just late to the party. And if that's the case, then great. You know, I really do hope this to serve as a refresher. However, if you're less familiar with what I'm about to suggest, I hope and I pray that this new method is like pouring water on a parched dry land, that this will lead to times of refreshment and bring new life into your times of prayer. So what am I actually talking about? Let me get really practical. I'm talking about opening the Bible, starting to read, pausing every verse or section of verses and turning it into a prayer. Maybe that wasn't quite the climax that you were hoping for. But honestly, this simple but powerful little method, I think, has the power to transform our prayer lives. So, quick example. I'm going to use a psalm, a well-known psalm. We're not limited to using the psalms, but they're a brilliant price to start. Psalms means the book of praises. God gave us the psalms so that we would give them back to him in prayer and worship. So, Psalm 23. Let me begin. This is what it could look like. Here's a little window into what some of my prayer as a being this last month as I've tried this. Say you, you open, you look at it, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And you stop there, you think, Lord, thank you that I have a shepherd. Thank you that I have someone to follow. Thank you that in a world often just full of confusing and conflicting ideas, I have someone leading me. God, I have someone guiding me. And God, I pray that you would, yes, guide me, but you'd also guide our family today. Guide us from, you know, and keep us from the temptation and ways of the world. Father, I pray that you would help those who don't have a shepherd today, those who feel alone, those who feel isolated, those who feel lost. Help us point them to you. And then maybe you pray whatever else comes to mind as you consider the words, the Lord is my shepherd. Then maybe you run out of things to say. What do you do? You move to the next verse. I shall not want. I shall not want. Lord, thank you that you provide for me daily. Lord, thank you that I've never really been in want. I haven't missed too many meals. That everything I have is a gift from you. Oh, God, I just repent now where the times where I've just, I lack gratitude. Oh, sometimes I totally lack like, gratitude. God, I bring that to you now. And Lord, I, I want to bring those who are in real need to you right now where the next meal isn't necessarily a given. Father, would you use your church to reach out to the most needy around us? Lord, comfort them. And Father, even though, you know, I, my most basic needs are met, I know that it brings you joy and that you want me to bring to you the things that I am worried about. So Lord, I, I do pray about the leaky roof. Lord, would you Please make it so that we don't pay through the roof for the roof. Amen. And maybe you just keep going, right? You've got more to say on that. What am I doing? I'm taking the words that originated in the heart and mind of God, that he's given to us in the scriptures, and I'm circulating them through my heart and my mind, and I'm giving them back to him. And by that means, your words become the wings, sorry, his words become the wings of your prayers. So, in the remaining time I have, I'm going to give you six quick reasons why praying scripture is a good idea. You ready? Six quick reasons why praying scripture is a good idea. Number one, praying the scriptures is the pattern of Jesus and the prophets. We see this in the Old and the New Testament. Now, 
it's not always the case that just because you see something that happened in the Bible, that means we should copy. You know, there's a lot of broken and sinful people in the Bible. So copying blindly could lead us into a bit of trouble. However, I can't think of a good reason why we shouldn't emulate these examples. Okay, so in the book of Nehemiah, right, in the Old Testament, God raises up this leader, Nehemiah, who sets about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But it isn't just the external walls that needed work, but the ruin in the city is like a mirror of their own hearts, right? Because they've been disobeyed God. They've strayed from his ways. So Ezra, the prophet, the right-hand man to Nehemiah, he leads all the people in a half day of prayer. Chapter 9, verse 3 says, They stood where they were and read from the book of the law for a quarter of the day and another quarter in confession and worshipping their God. And the whole prayer is scripturally informed, right? You can read it. But then we have this moment in verses 17 and 18 where he quotes Exodus, Exodus 34, verse 6, well-known verse. And he says, but you, God, are ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. So what's he done? He's applied God's past faithfulness to their current situation and he's let it shape their prayers. We also see this in the New Testament. We see this where Jesus is on the cross in agony. Dan talked about this just last week. When he's under immense physical, emotional, spiritual pain, when he's squeezed beyond measure, what do we see come out? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So yes, Jesus was being forsaken by the Father in that moment for our sakes. But that wasn't the first time that these words have appeared in our Bibles. See, Another person had poured out their heart to God years earlier called David. Goes on to be King David in Psalm 22. And Jesus knows those words. And Jesus turns those verses into his own prayer just before he dies. So number one, praying the scriptures. We pray the scriptures because it's the pattern of Jesus in the prophets. Number two, praying the scriptures helps us focus. Just literally helps us focus. You know, often in my times of prayer, they can come at the beginning or at the end of the day, and maybe you have a similar rhythm. One barrier, I think, can just be like mental drain, you know, just it's early and maybe uh, there's a lot of other things suddenly filling up in your mind, things you need to do for the day, things shouting at you, I'm important, you know, and if it's or if it's the end of the day, sometimes just tiredness can just get the better of me. We have to acknowledge our weakness here, our humanness here, you know. We we can be like Peter, James and John when they're in the garden with uh, Jesus, garden of Gethsemane. What happened? They fell asleep three times instead of praying. Jesus acknowledges himself. He says, the spirit's willing, but guys, the flesh is very weak. Seriously. We maybe start with the best intentions in the world to pray and then not pray or pray without really praying or even fall asleep. Praying the scriptures is a great way to fight mental drift. You know, when I say mental drift, I'm not talking about, you know, the distractions or anxieties or things that pop into your head. I'm not talking about that being a problem. I think we should be bringing those to God. That's exactly what God wants us to do with them. But we all know there's a difference between that and maybe just 10 minutes of daydreaming. Theologian and Pastor John Piper, he comments on this. And he says, If I try to pray for people or events without having the word open in front of me, guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One negative thing is that my mind tends to wander. And I think instead about what I'm wearing or the Venetian blinds that's halfway open or that that siren out in the street and I'm wondering, oh, what's happening there? I'm jerked all around by my inattentiveness. But the Bible holds my attention because I'm looking at it, I'm reading it. When you pray the Bible, you can pray all day that way. So, number three, praying the scriptures expands our horizons of prayer. I wonder, do you ever find yourself praying just for the same things? Maybe just what's like in front of you, your own concerns. It's not a problem. It's not not like a bad thing to pray for those things. But I think if those become all the things we ever pray about, I think that could be a problem. But when we pray with the Bible open in front of us, we end up praying about a wide variety of things and not just the things that affect us. You know, the Bible, it's true for all of humanity, but it's not true for all of humanity necessarily at the very same time. 
this is what I mean. Like maybe um, you've had this before when you've been reading a portion of scripture and as you're reading it, um, you think, man, like, I don't know, it's a bit about um, how God can, is your protector in times of trouble or how he'll deal, deal with your enemies. And you think, well, I'm glad that's true, but it's not really relevant to me right now in this moment. See, that's not our moment just to skip forwards, right? Or it's not our moment 